Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm uh, Edward Jurechin, the director of the Baker Institute, and I wish to warmly welcome you to warm Houston uh, and to the uh, Baker Institute. As I'm sure all of you know, the energy program is one of our premier research programs at the Baker Institute. It's one of the very first programs we initiated some nine, eight, nine years ago. And, uh, and I want to thank Amy Jaffe and her research team and our productive and successful research collaboration with the Petroleum Energy Center of Japan, which is one of the first collaborations we entered into. Uh, the study we are about to launch today, the energy dimension in Russian global strategy, is uh, actually our 12th uh, energy study. Uh, earlier this year, we unveiled a major study on the geopolitics of natural gas. It was a very well-attended conference here at the Baker Institute. And we will also be releasing a major study looking ahead on emerging energy technologies on nanoscience and energy uh, by the end of the year. We have uh, our leading collaborator here at Rice is Dr. Rick Smalley, who's a Nobel laureate uh, in chemistry and uh, very well known in the field of uh, nanotechnology. Uh, our next energy study will look at the role of na national oil companies in the global context, an issue that is becoming, as you all know, increasingly important in geopolitical terms. I would personally like to thank my good friend, uh, Mr. Masahisa Naito, uh, chairman and CEO of the Institute of Energy Economics for his unabiding support uh, to the Baker Institute and its mission to promote the development of informed and realistic public policy choices in the energy area. I could not have found a better collaborator than uh, Mr. Naito. <clears throat> My thanks uh, also to the Petroleum Energy Center of Japan and its president, Tommy Kudo. Uh, Tommy, there you are. <laughs> uh, for organizing today's study together with the Institute for Energy Economics of Japan. Our joint energy research partnership with PEC remains our most successful international venture to date, and we deeply appreciate uh, the opportunity to continue to study the international energy scene together with fine scholars and government experts from Japan. Today's meeting reflects the quality of that collaboration and the wide range of experts that are here who will be addressing uh, us today will shed much light on the latest situation in energy markets and the very important role Russia has to play in promoting secure and stable energy supplies to uh, world energy markets. Uh, the study highlights the risks and unique political and cultural factors that will influence Russia's energy development and international uh, policies. Uh, I noted today that in the Wall Street Journal of this morning, uh, they've already predetermined what we're going to say. <laughs> Uh, there's, a, <laughs> there's a little, uh, there's a big article uh, and a, a small paragraph, but a study to be released today by the Baker Institute at Rice University in Houston warns Russian growth will continue at a slower pace and its growth is unlikely to be sufficient to undercut current high world prices in the near to medium term. So now that the Wall Street Journal has uh, concluded our studies, I will welcome you all to an early lunch. <laughs> <laughs> we, but in any case, you can see the issue that we're dealing with is a, uh, a high priority issue and very much uh, in the news. <clears throat> uh, we are fortunate to have many sponsors to thank for their support on this program on Russian energy. Uh, I would like to thank each one of them. The petrol I mentioned the Petroleum Energy Center of Japan, the Renaissance Capital, Baker and Botts, Lehman Brothers, and our Energy Forum members including our advisory board members, Aramco Services, uh, BP, Chevron Texaco, ConocoPhillips, ExxonMobil, Halliburton, Marathon Oil, Noble Corporation, Schlumberger, Shell, Shell Exploration and Production Company. You could see some of the leading energy companies and service companies. We would also like to acknowledge uh, two leading research institutions that lent the time and effort of outstanding scholars to guide our efforts, the Carnegie Endowment, <clears throat> for International Peace and the Institute for World Economy and International Relations, IMAMO, of the Russian Academy of Science. Uh, I welcome the director of IMAMO, Mr. Nordari Simonia, uh, for his first, uh, Mr. Simonia, uh, of what I hope will be many visits to the Baker Institute. 
and also to Martha Alcott, who has been a pivotal advisor to this uh, project. Martha, where are you hiding? There you go. As we have an outstanding lineup of presentations today, you can see from the program, the study has such richness of detail and insights, it really will be difficult to, to really cover everything in just a one-day workshop. But I encourage you to take uh, copies of many of the working papers that are outside and that have been prepared for this study and to visit our website in the uh, coming weeks for additional materials. I don't think this subject needs much introduction in a world where oil prices are hovering above $50 and Russia has been one of the lone oil producers to raise output significantly. As our study team will present over the morning session, the potential for Russia to provide even more energy to the world market is enormous, but it faces major political, cultural, economic, and technical challenges that will be discussed here today. In the immediate aftermath of the September 11th attacks, Russia announced its willingness to help the West to diversify its oil sources to include a growing stream of Russian crude. Russia's President Vladimir Putin, in a historic address here at the Baker Institute, declared that Russia could be a strategic alternative to OPEC. Uh, that caught the attention of this very energy-concentrated audience here. America has moved from hostility to friendship with Moscow in one generation, and I feel confident that the two countries will continue to build on the current cooperative framework despite occasional differences in policy matters. I served in Moscow at the American Embassy during the height of the Cold War in 1979, a very difficult year, Afghanistan, and uh, I can tell you, uh, to me, I never thought I would see the changes that have occurred in my lifetime alone. And I knew Imamo under entirely different circumstances <laughs> at the time, so I'm very happy to have you here. Um, as I said, we were delighted to have hosted at the Baker Institute President Vladimir Putin's first major address in the United States in 2002. And we also hosted the plenary sessions of the first U.S.-Russia Commercial Energy uh, Summit here in October 2002. So we've been very much involved in U.S.-Russian relations in the energy field. <clears throat> the development of Russian-American joint strategies for cooperation in the energy sector remains an important area in the U.S.-Russian relationship, but it has had its ups and downs in recent months. The U.S.-Russia dialogue on energy cooperation began with strong enthusiasm on both sides about the common goals and achievements that could be reached. But the Kremlin's recent policies have raised some questions about how far down the path of privatization that President Putin is willing to go. It is hard to encourage American firms to commit a sizable investment against this uncertain backdrop. And so many questions and much work is going to have to be done in the months ahead. The Putin government's actions since last summer when senior executives with, uh, of UCOS were arrested has made clear that the Kremlin, not the commercial sector, uh, will set national priorities. Uh, I think we see this very clearly in official statements that have been made on pipeline strategies to the east, to Asia. <laughs> this means that the prospects of export pipeline additions to private sector involvement may be slow to materialize, raising questions about whether Russia's current expansion in oil and gas output will continue at the same rapid pace in the future. And I'm sure this issue will be discussed in detail here amongst you, the experts. Uh, in today's sessions, scholars will give their opinions about the potential of Russian energy and the political environment in which energy development will take place. We will also discuss pipeline politics and the impact of Russian oil and gas on international markets. To begin our session, I would like to introduce my good friend and colleague, Mr. Naito, Chairman and CEO of the Institute of Energy Economics of Japan. Mr. Naito has been a leading voice promoting sound energy policy in Japan for several decades now and has held a wide variety of important posts in MITI and the private energy sector over his illustrious career. Mr. Naito will describe in greater detail the framework for today's session. Join me in welcoming Mr. Naito to the portfolio. <clears throat> Good 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Masai Sanaito. I am a chairman and the CEO of Institute of Energy Economics Japan. I would like to express my sincere appreciation to His uh, Excellency Ambassador Edward Drejan, uh, Ms. Amy Jaffe, and many others for all you have kindly done to enable, to enable us to uh, attend this important workshop. It is really a pleasure for me to share these uh, precious opportunities with such a distinguished group of researchers assembled here for this presentation and discussion. From Japan, uh, we have a total of five delegates attending this uh, workshop, including Mr. Uh, Kudo, President of Japan Petroleum Energy Center. Uh, during the workshop, Mr. Uh, Kobayashi, Research Fellow of uh, IEEJ, and Mr. Motomura, Chief Representative of Japan Oil, Gas, and Metals National Corporation, so-called uh, JOGMEC, will each make a presentation on their perspectives uh, on the research topics. Since uh, its establishment over a decade ago, the Baker Institute has continued to attract attention from around the world for its consistently excellent research results and profound contributions to the formation of the energy strategies of the United States government. Our association with the Baker Institute extends over a decade, and our US-Japan joint research project has now entered into the sixth year since its inception in 1999. We recognize that the substantial results are also increasing both in terms of quality and quantity year by year. Right from uh, the out outset, we positioned energy security as our most important issue and have been uh, conducting comprehensive research analysis from many perspectives on global uh, trends worthy of attention. Trends which have the politi political of influencing the long-term stable supply to both the United States and Japan. During last year, we had, we, last year as well as uh, this year, we have focused our research studies on the energy situation in Russia, as Ambassador Dredgen mentioned. With the huge energy reserve resource uh, potential, Russian, Russia, under the Putin administration, has uh, demonstrated its skill in interweaving energy policies with diplomatic policies. This has been done by the enforcing state-initiated strategies in various areas, domestically as symbolized by the UCOS situation. It has meant the pressuring and reorganization of the Russian oil industry. In doing with foreign countries, it has meant polit policies for the entry of foreign uh, capital and development by foreign companies in Russia, as well as export considerations. And politics have been involved in plans for the laying of pipelines. Energy demand in the world led by China and India is expected to increase dramatically in the future. Consequently, the importance of research on the energy situation and the policy trends in Russia with its enormous supply potential, will also increase significantly. In this environment, the holding of the seminar on the latest energy situation in Russia and international energy markets in mid-June uh, in Tokyo <coughs> was very timely. And one of the organizers of the event, I was very pleased and applaud that many of the seminar attendants expressed their overwhelming approval of the seminar and were highly impressed by the exceptionally high standard of the lectures presented by 
uh, members of the Baker Institute, including His Excellency Ambassador Edward Dredgen and Ms. Jaffe. In view of the success of this seminar in June, I have great expectations for today's workshop and hope that it will further increase the value and accuracy of our research on Russia since last year by introducing new perspectives uh, found in the workshop. Today's uh, program includes five uh, interesting topics. One, Russia's oil and gas uh, supply potential and the strategies of Russian cooperation. Two, politics and energy policy in Russia. Three, U.S.-Russian uh, energy cooperation. Four, pipeline politics. Five, the impact of Russian oil and gas on the international market. As for uh, topic one, the uh, purpose of this discussion is to determine the amount of oil and gas resources in Russia, which is the departure point of the discussion on energy issue in Russia. As for point two uh, in this topic, the nature, characteristics, and the direction of Russian politics will be discussed, particularly from the standpoint of energy policy. The relationship between business and politics and their expected interplay will also be highlighted. As for point three, the description of U.S.-Russian energy cooperation in concrete terms, hopefully as close as in the actual agenda, will provide the attendees with a valuable and interesting basis for discussion on the future of the U.S. energy security. As for point four, uh, the direction of this contentious issue will surely have an important impact on the energy security of Northeastern Asia, particularly Japan, China, and Korea. Suggestions or hints would be welcome and on how to reach ideal situations for all parties concerned. As for uh, point five, this will eventually be the focus of interest for the workshop uh, attendees. Inferences should be supported by concrete facts and data. Uh, discussions will be encouraged on, on, recommend, on recommended uh, strategies for the U.S. and Japanese oil industry. From the perspective of Japan, uh, which currently depends on the Middle East for the majority of its oil import, imports, there is a desire to evaluate how this Russian Trump card could be effectively used to diversify Japan's current sources of energy supply. The information required to form the basis for such an evaluation includes political situation surrounding pipeline routes. Uh, in my understanding, it will be decided uh, around 7th or 8th of February next year when Mr. Putin visits Japan. Oil and gas development and production policies in Sakhalin and other places and the direction of Russia's energy export uh, policies. I understand that these issues are all covered by the study subjects of this research project. And I believe that the results from this research on Russia will present to us valuable suggestions on how to ensure energy security for our nations. It is hard to foresee a dramatic reduction in the world's uh, dependence on hydrocarbons like oil and natural gas at, in an, at, at least uh, for uh, another uh, 30 years. Therefore, uh, we can assume that the geopolitical impact brought about by the speculation and the strategies of countries and the interplay of uh, strategic uh, initiatives 
between nations in effort to acquire and secure these limited resources of oil and natural gas will increase considerably. This in turn will have an uh, enormous impact on the energy security of the uh, countries concerned. In this uh, sense, the present plan for US-Japan joint research project from January 2005 onward to focus on the strategies and geopolitical influences of the emerging state-owned oil companies, which already have a considerable influence over the industrial international energy market. With their overwhelming share of uh, energy resources and whose influence will uh, continue to grow, is an excellent plan. And in my understanding, uh, seven oil majors' uh, production share at this moment is 17%, but uh, the reserve is only 5%. That means how state-owned uh, companies have strong influence all over the world. Uh, this focus is not surely timely, but also comforts uh, with the primary objective of the U.S.-Japan Joint Energy Research Project, that is to further develop and continue our research on the basis of the previously obtained results. And uh, with this in mind, uh, I am convinced that we are uh, heading in a very positive direction, already uh, well on uh, course to the success of this uh, research project. I sincerely hope that all of you who have come together here today will, with, will regard this workshop as a valuable opportunity to further enhance of the, of the value and uh, accuracy of the research results to date through the presentations, uh, vigorous uh, and in-depth discussion, and uh, free and open exchange of opinions. In closing, uh, I would like to say that is my firm belief that this workshop today will prove timely, meaningful uh, for every one of the part participants. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we look forward to a, a great afternoon, morning and afternoon session uh, with all the uh, researchers. Uh, and I'm going to just start us out a little bit. Uh, I'm Amy Jaffe, and I am the Wallace Wilson Fellow for Energy Studies here at the Baker Institute. Um, I am going to uh, present our uh, key findings. Um, and then I'm going to turn, uh, turn the program over to our actual researchers. So I have the uh, great pleasure of, for five or ten minutes, taking credit for everybody's conclusions. And uh, then uh, we'll have, uh, you'll hear it uh, straight from the horse's mouth. So, Cal? There we go. Um, we, um... Uh, I think our, our, our key conclusion is that uh, Russia is entering a potentially historic moment of opportunity uh, to become a world energy superpower. And as, uh, as you'll hear later today, um, there is this possibility that Russia could become a really important player, um, not only in terms of its supply and, 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 and domination of the market, both in oil and gas, uh, but also in its utilization of energy as a diplomatic tool uh, and as a means of foreign policy. And the question is, how is that going to be implemented? What kind of cultural and political factors, what kind of international uh, forces will determine uh, how Russia uh, takes on that role and, and how it uses that role in international discourse? Um, the potential for strong growth in Russian oil production is real. Uh, we don't have to bring in all the peakists who say we're running out of oil. We can look around uh, the basins of, of Russia and see that there's a tremendous amount of potential there uh, that could be developed in 
and unleashed into the oil market. Um, oil exports could rise by over 2 million barrels a day between now and 2008, uh, based on uh, just known resources, in other words, without exploration, um, and using uh, existing cash flow for uh, the largest Russian oil majors. Uh, that increase, uh, just that increase alone, uh, could be obtained mainly from the production areas controlled by uh, just a handful of companies, and that would be Luke Oil, Yukos, TNK, and Surrogate Neftegas. Uh, Rick Gordon will talk in more detail about that this morning. Um, but, uh, and there's always a but when one talks about energy because it uh, so, is so influenced by both national and international politics, uh, the Kremlin's plans to re for reorganization uh, could dampen the level of increase uh, by disrupting the speedy implementation of plans to remove infrastructure complaints. Uh, constraints, or if that were to cause a slowdown in capital expenditures and project development. So really, uh, the new policies that we're seeing in Russia today uh, will have great impact not only of the long-term future of the industry, which I obviously is the intention of the Russian government to put the industry in a healthy path for the long term, but in the short term, uh, the sort of unintended consequences of, uh, of a dramatic restructuring. Uh, in the pipeline system and how it's managed and in the nature of uh, assets and how they're managed uh, could bring about a slowdown uh, in the really incredible expansion we've seen in the industry in the last couple of years. Um, on pipeline issues, uh, uh, again, as Dr. Gordon will uh, spell out uh, this morning, um, a lot of the sustainable export growth we've seen um, you know, in the hundreds of thousands of barrels a day are going to be dependent uh, in the coming years on the removal of several major bottlenecks in the Russian pipeline export system. Uh, those include uh, some kind of transportation for the resources in East Siberia, uh, an additional northern route to the Barents Sea that would allow uh, ocean-bound movements by large tankers, uh, and there's a, a crying need for a new bypass uh, of the bottleneck in the Bosporus Strait. Um, it, uh, I think recent political events and economic events in Russia have made clear that state control of the pipeline sector is here to stay. Now, we're not likely to see uh, a change or reform in the way pipelines are managed that's going to bring a tremendous amount of private initiative into that sector, uh, and that raises the question of financing. Um, it is, uh, again, the opinion of our researchers that state funds and the program of raising tariffs is not really going to be enough to raise the capital needed for some of these major projects that are, have price tags on them of upwards of $12 billion. And so that raises a question of uh, how the Russian state is going to put together the financing needed to uh, come up with the capital for these projects. Um, Big questions. Uh, there's been a discussion about whether uh, foreign companies would be allowed to participate, and if they did, on what basis. Um, in recent uh, weeks, I guess, uh, there's also been discussion uh, inside Transnaft about tapping the state stabilization fund that was created in 2003 uh, to utilize windfall oil profits, oil and gas profits, uh, for, for major economic development. And the question is, uh, will Russia decide to tap that to finance some of these projects? On the geopolitical side, um, uh, Russia, as we uh, all know from reading the press, has been actively courted by a number of major players in the world scene, the United States, China, Japan, the EU. And uh, the question is, will the Kremlin play this role as uh, the savior and moderator of uh, $50 oil? And I, uh, again, I think uh, as our discussions over the uh, uh, next few hours will discuss, uh, there's a lot more entailed uh, than intention. I think that the Russian government has made its intention clear to play this role. But the question is, in terms of its own internal organization of its industry, uh, will it be able to meet both goals, its domestic political goals and national goals, and these, this stated international goal to be uh, a moderator in global prices, given the pressures that we see today in the market and given the fact that uh, the kinds of incremental volumes needed are going to be so large. 
Um, uh, again, on the geopolitical scene, um, one of uh, the key issues for the development of the eastern pipeline routes is uh, Russia's concern about the fate of those reason, regions inside Russia, as uh, Dr. Simone will talk about the demographic cha challenges uh, along uh, those regions and border uh, and their meaning for Russian sovereignty and uh, concerns about uh, splintering um, or, or other kind of disruptive movements uh, if economic development uh, in that region is not uh, progressed. Um, the other thing that we're seeing that the study concludes is that energy has become a key plank to Russia's diplomacy in Asia. Um, there is clearly an intention to try to speed up an integration process in, inside the Asia Pacific, um, but the rooting of pipeline, as uh, we'll hear over the course of the day from a number of speakers, uh, remains an economic and diplomatic problem. Talk a little bit about uh, uh, the last couple of months' uh, events inside the domestic industry in Russia. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of change. Uh, if the, all the presenters today look tired, it's because everybody's having to be revising their papers daily. And uh, uh, Ambassador Region always jokes, we had this wonderful conference in Moscow uh, last June, and Mikhail Khodorkovsky was the keynote speaker. And, I think he was arrested a few days later, and so we had a, a, a remorse that maybe it's bad luck to be a keynote speaker at the Baker Institute. So, um, Anyway, uh, as Martha Alcott and others will discuss, uh, some of the events that seem so surprising today in the Russian sector were actually uh, predictable if people were looking at the right documentation. Uh, it turns out that uh, President Putin himself wrote a dissertation on uh, what he believes should be the proper way to manage the natural resources sector in Russia. Uh, he wrote that treatise in 1999. And if you go back and read it word for word, uh, it's like a script uh, for today's politics uh, in the Russian oil sector. Um, clearly, uh, as this treatise out, uh, outlines, and we can see today in the actions of the state that uh, there uh, is a promotion of a mixed system of state and private, private ownership and assets, uh, but that the state plays the role of protecting the interests of the nation. Uh, we're not going to see a private ownership system that we think of here in the United States where corporations act in their own best interests, and therefore the public good might be sacrificed. Um, since early 2004, uh, President Putin has made some dramatic new appointment appointments in the cabinet and in his presidential administration and also in uh, the helm of some of the state oil and gas firms. Um, and we will uh, observe and discuss the fact that uh, many who are now moving ahead in the Russian system uh, have backgrounds in the state security uh, system. And uh, we're seeing basically a new group of people come in uh, to replace uh, the officials who used to be commonly referred to as the Yeltsin family. Uh, we're seeing a lot of the previous reformers who were in charge of policy in Russia have really been pushed out of government. Um, in our opinion, this sea change is likely to affect the business model for Russian industry. Uh, we anticipate a new round of redistribution of petroleum assets. Uh, as uh, Dr. Pusenkova will discuss, uh, we see an emerging new corporate responsibility um, that will follow uh, unwritten rules that have uh, seemed to be laid down uh, over the last year or two for uh, uh, what it means to be the leader of a Russian oil or gas company. One has to be patriotic. One has to overpay one's taxes. Um, and, and a whole host of variety of uh, concerns that are a mixture of uh, concerns for the social and uh, welfare of the populations where the company is operating and, uh, and other kinds of priorities that are not in the Western shareholder maximization profit uh, genre. Uh, the new rules uh, of the game are going to involve limits to Western involvement uh, and uh, reward less uh, companies who promote Western-style management at the disadvantage of other priorities. Um, we'll have an afternoon session that will talk about the market impact of Russian oil and gas. 
Uh, one of our key conclusions, uh, for those of you who track the differential in the price between Asian oil contracted price from the Middle East and the American price, uh, our uh, analysis is that there won't be enough Russian oil, even if the maximum rate of oil is developed from East Siberia, uh, to eliminate this premium. Uh, it is possible that um, if every barrel that could came out uh, from East Siberia to Asia, and on top of that, Iraq came back and their industry was reconfigured, and at the same time, uh, all of the barrels that are going to come online in Iran over the next few years if everything went to Asia. Uh, unfortunately, it still wouldn't be enough, in our opinion, uh, to really uh, uh, do too much harm to the Asian premium. It would take an additional uh, oil management policy that would either favor GTL or, or other uh, fuels as a substitute, and our opinion is, as Dr. Saligo will discuss later today, that it would take another million barrels a day of demand management in Asia uh, to have all these additional supplies work to help eliminate the premium. Uh, on the LNG side, uh, we look forward to hearing from Dr. Hartley about our modeling of different scenarios in Russia. Um, it is uh, true that the Eastern Pipeline, should they come to be, uh, will help uh, uh, contain LNG uh, prices in Asia from rising substantially. Um, but the extent to which, uh, if all these projects come online, uh, the, the marginal difference in, in LNG prices and as a matter of percentage is not all that large, something about uh, 20 to 30 cents per million BTU. Um, consumer country strategies. Uh, this is something that um, I think will take a lot of discussion uh, to think about uh, in the current environment if Russia uh, cannot play the role as uh, uh, savior as they have uh, were cast immediately after September 11 as this uh, full means to eliminate the dependence on the Middle East. That's clearly not going to be able to happen. And so, um, so the question really is, uh, what other kinds of things do consuming countries need to do in addition to uh, expanding their relationship with Russia on an energy basis? Um, and so we have a few uh, initial uh, recommendations. Uh, one is that there needs to be a more measured and concerted effort by oil-consuming nations to establish energy policies that do not depend on influencing outcomes inside oil-producing countries. I think there's been a preponderance of diplomacy of Chinese, American, and, uh, and, and other diplomats flying to different producing countries hoping uh, to get them to increase their supply or reform their sector or give somebody an oil field. And uh, all of that has not resulted in a terrible amount of energy security for the international system. And so clearly, uh, other kinds of policies are needed. Uh, in our opinion, there needs to be a higher priority to diplomacy that focuses on alliance with other major oil-consuming nations. Uh, that is at the very bottom of our energy diplomacy. We're so busy flying to the capitals uh, that have uh, oil-producing countries. We do do some serious work with the International Energy Agency. Uh, but in our opinion, uh, the uh, diplomatic work with our, our, our people or countries of the same interests as us, and that includes China and India, really need to be on a higher order of magnitude and at a higher level of diplomacy than they are today. Uh, we feel strongly that we need to enhance the international institutions and mechanisms that favor markets over political intervention in energy by government. Uh, we, we believe that not enough effort has been made to bring the rules of global oil trade and investment into harmony with other rules we've already implemented internationally in areas like manufacturing sector, services, banking. Um, we make this exception for oil, uh, that it should be a coveted and protected industry around the world. And as a result, we're not seeing resource development. Uh, as Mr. Naito mentioned, uh, the international commercial private companies are operating in 6% of reserves worldwide. And the remaining reserves are cut off uh, to foreign participation or to, to open access for investment. And uh, that, in my opinion, not that we're running out of oil, that is indeed the reason why we're at $45, I'm sorry, $55 and rising. Uh, and I was uh, kidding with somebody today uh, that since uh, Alan Greenspan identified that we'd have to get to $80 uh, 
uh, before we'd be in a 1973-like crisis, was he making a, uh, a target for the speculators in the market to believe is the top of the market? Because uh, hopefully that's not the case, but uh, there is this huge pressure in the market. We're going into the high demand season of the winter, and uh, clearly the system that we have in the international community today where uh, several nations can decide to not invest in their resources to the detriment of the rest of the world community uh, is not a good global system for the future of uh, progress in, in the international community. Uh, we believe that liberalization and open access for investment through uh, 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 institutions like the European Energy Charter uh, is, is an important uh, a possibility. And uh, we also believe that the Bush administration has done a good job trying to create new international cooperation on alternative energy technologies, such as uh, automobile technology and renewable energy. Uh, there have been the efforts on ITER and uh, clean coal and carbon sequestration, uh, but we would encourage governments to give more attention to solar-derived energy and uh, more collaboration on improved automobile efficiency. So with that, I'm uh, uh, going to take the opportunity to uh, invite our first two panelists to come to the uh, front, and that is Dr. Richard Gordon, who is the Executive Vice President at John S. Harold Incorporated. Uh, Rick, I've known and worked with Rick for many years back when uh, I was uh, not an academic. That's right. Yeah. And uh, Rick is one of the uh, world authorities on competitor analysis uh, in the corporate private sector, and he'll be speaking uh, today on the subject of uh, uh, the outlook for Russian oil and gas and uh, with a particular view to the performance of the Russian corporate sector and their strategies. Uh, also serving on this panel is Mr. Masumi Matamora, who is the chief researcher for the Oil and Gas Business Environment Research Group of uh, the Japan Oil, Gas, and Metals National Corporation, uh, and he will also talk about uh, the outlook for Russia. Rick, you go first. Okay. All right. How do you... yeah. I'm sorry, Amy. I need a little more assistance here. Oh. Gonna... oh, okay. We're loading. Is he? No. Uh, uh, hold on. Cal? There we go. No, no. This is mine. <laughs> no. <laughs> Another one. Well, maybe we can reverse direction here. Shall we? Uh, okay, hold on a second. We're giving priority to those who travel the longest distance. I think that's only fair. <laughs> I got a few miles on the treads myself, sure but not, not to this meeting, to other ones. Uh, would it be possible for, for him to flip when I tell him to? He's way back in the back, so you oh, okay. push him okay. right there. Okay. Uh, just as an aside, the reason I was asking that question is because I'm uh, uh, one of these types who likes to wander. I, I, moving The podium is like an anchor, you know, and I'm in a deep sea all of a sudden. But it's an election year. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I want to thank the Baker Institute for the opportunity to do this study. Um, economists don't often get a chance to stretch their brains quite as much as I got to with this one. Uh, all too often, we get sort of sort of locked up in the confines of our own uh, uh, discipline which uh, I frankly believe is just a few pounds short of a full load sometimes because of the fact that it jettisoned political, the political part of political economy uh, some time ago. Uh, but I do appreciate the opportunity uh, to, to speak here. There was one credit I wanted to give as well. Uh, some of what you're about to see and what you'll see in the paper itself uh, benefited immensely from discussions I had with a really dear friend of mine, uh, Ed Morris, uh, who uh, doesn't take any credit for what's in here. So anything that's wrong is my fault. Anything that's right is Ed's credit. 
The objective here was to take a forward-looking evaluation of the domestic and the international strategies of the leading Russian oil companies. We focused on the six companies that you can see here. Uh, basically, for information purposes, we were not able to include Rosneft at that time. We generated forecasts of likely future production by company and future export potential. Uh, the twist, so to speak, to our analysis is that we don't believe you can separate the financial and the operational dimensions of any company, whether it's Royal Dutch Shell or T&K. And in fact, we believe that uh, the results of the study suggest that there is a considerable amount of information bound up in the interplay between operational and financial <coughs> dimensions that explains why T&K did what it did, as opposed to why Yukos did what it did, and the corresponding outcomes. Uh, so we, we use a model here, the capital strategies model, which is really a dynamic capital allocation, simulation, and forecast model. And by that, I mean basically that it combines everything from dividend payments to investment and new production. All capital allocation decisions are fair game in this model. The strategic imperative for exports in Russia is pretty straightforward. It has to do with the simple fact that the raw capacity to produce within Russia grossly outweighs Russian needs at this time. Uh, there is just, it, much like Saudi Arabia, there is absolutely no purpose to further development in Russia if one does not export it. It's absolutely essential. And this is the, the driving force behind much of what you see in Russian company strategies as we go forward. Specifically, number one, production growth. Absolute strategic imperative, production growth. Number two, that growth targeted to the export markets. And when you look at the price differentials that they receive on crude oil, which is what this chart is basically trying to show, the light gray on the far right is what Luke Oil reports as being their domestic sales realization for crude oil within Russia. Now, we can quarrel with how accurate these price spreads are between the domestic and the international price. In fact, this is one of the great dilemmas within Russia right now is the lack of a truly transparent domestic market for crude oil with third-party transactions. Uh, having worked years and years ago in the corporate tax division for an oil company, I can guarantee you these kind of differences combined with the ambiguities of a non-transparent market are rife with opportunity for tax lawsuits over transfer pricing. It's just a, it's a landmine waiting to go off. <coughs> and I wouldn't want to be handling taxation issues here. However, oil price convergence, that is the prospect that domestic sales prices would eventually converge to some sort of parity with international prices is a major potential outcome of the drive to export. <coughs> that is carried to its logical conclusion, the drive to export will continue until domestic Russian prices converge to international. And you can see, looking at the first half of 2004, just how much Luke Oil's domestic oil sales price would have to rise for that to occur. But nevertheless, keep that in mind that that's a tension, so to speak, driving the industry at this point. Now, we have to make many, many assumptions in this model run that we've, we've done. Uh, among others, we assume that one or more additional outlets to the sea, such as the Murmansk pr proposal, are realized. We also assume that pipeline bypass of the Bosphorus occurs. And I have to tell you, we're not just assuming small solutions here. We're talking 
this will, to see the results that we're talking about occur, we're talking between one and two million barrel a day capacities at both outlet points. Okay, that's what's going to be necessary to make it happen. And therein lies one of the real dilemmas in Russia today. That is, how are we going to get that pipeline capacity in place? We use three world price scenarios. The base case, which is what you see here, is in effect the supposition that the price of oil after this year falls back down to a new, much higher level, namely about $30. The low price is a $25 case, in effect. The high price is a $35 case. So those were the scenario assumptions that we used. I want you to notice right here, this particular case assumes that Russian domestic prices remain discounted. This particular case going upwards is what we call the convergence case. Now again, I want to emphasize, for convergence to occur, export capacity must effectively exhaust the current <clears throat> surplus weighting down the domestic market. Now you, you should really realistically ask yourself though, from the government's perspective, is that a desirable result? Is that likely to be a policy result that the, the Putin administration would look forward to, especially if it were to occur quickly? I don't think so. In the paper, we suggest that what we have is, in effect, a price control system at work. And it represents a substantial subsidy to the domestic non-energy industry within Russia. And that's very difficult to let that, that change quickly. These are our output projections. We put the axis intercepts. By the way, this is just for the companies and the projects that you see here. Again, we do not include Rosneft. Uh, there are a couple of other omissions, obviously. Marathon with KMOC. Uh, and a few others along the way. Uh, but we don't think that the material, res the results would be materially different, just the levels would be higher. The intercept with the vertical axis is set to 2003. All of the forecasts you see here, in effect, start from end of year 2003 forward. Okay, and so that's the baseline. And you can see the incremental production for export that we anticipate occurring. Now, I want you to notice it staggers upwards somewhat slightly for a couple of years, and then there's a bit of a jump. That's the pipelines coming into play, okay? The other thing I want you to note, though, is how it flattens after 2008. One conclusion of the model is that there is a very high risk that Russian production capacity will hit a brick wall after 2008. It's got nothing to do with resources. It's got nothing to do with capacity to produce or to find. It's got to do with getting the oil to market. Now, production growth of this sort <coughs> is going to require very substantial increases in capital spending. And those increases are plotted here. And basically what we're showing here is that, uh, in effect, a near, a uh, slight, well, roughly a doubling of CapEx from 2003 to 2007, 2008 levels. Now, high oil prices have radically changed the potential implications of all of this, in particular, What's happened in recent months, in past years, say, is that rising and very high oil prices are, in effect, enabling the Russian companies to fund this CapEx on their own accounts, something that would not have been possible for all of them under the price assumptions that ruled just two years ago, for example. <laughs> prices have risen. Multiple changes are likely, but I emphasize the, the point at the bottom. The effect of rising prices doesn't change the conclusions of my paper. It merely reinforces them. And 
we'll proceed now, if you will, to some of those conclusions. But first, I've got one, one last chart that I want you to look at, and I know it's ugly and it's all over the place, but its ugliness is part of its beauty. What this is showing is capital reinvestment requirements by company as a percent of projected capital inflows under the base price scenario. I want you to focus on two things. One is, to the left of 2003, notice that the, <coughs> the range of variation wasn't that far. It wasn't that wide. In other words, there was general similarity in the conditions facing most of the Russian oil companies. By contrast, look to the right, and it just explodes. Now remember, this is based on $30 oil. Okay? That's the first thing. The second thing is I want you to look at the very wide differences between those companies on the upper scales here versus down here. Very dramatic differences in their capacity to fund their capital programs. TNK, Luke Oil, and Sibneft in the upper range. Surgut, Yukos in the lower range. I would suggest, and bear in mind, this is like we're back in 2003 again. I would suggest that is why TNK needed and this is why Yukos was championing the East Siberia mines. Yukos needed investment opportunities. TNK needed capital. Notice also then these two companies here, Sibneft and Luke Oil. A run-up in capital requirements relative to cash inflows out through about 2007 or thereabouts. <coughs> now, to fund that, the model assumes they're going to take on debt. There is another alternative, of course. Ally yourself with an outside investor, which I think is part of the ConocoPhillips Luke Oil transaction. Okay. So we notice here then, first of all, everybody's looking the same, now nobody looks the same. Different opinions throughout the Russian oil industry as to what they need. Some needing capital, some needing investment outlets. But I also want you to notice the collapsing CapEx requirements for Luke Oil after 2007. They rapidly become a Yukos. In other words, they need investment outlets. What better investment outlet to circumvent all the problems of Russia than West Kurna in Iraq? Right? Or something like it. And a U.S. company could help in that. Russian oil companies face an emerging investment challenge. It's not unique to the Russian companies, but it leads to uniquely Russian <coughs> results in this particular case. At current prices, yes, there's going to be much higher profitability this year. However, unless they can find outlets for their capital, that profitability will rapidly collapse. The reason? Buildup of underutilized capital. They'll either have to distribute it, which I don't think is a, an acceptable solution, or they've got to find investment outlets. <coughs> this is just one expanded example to show you the Luke Oil results. And you'll notice there's six different price scenarios here. Each scenario, low, base, high, with and without convergence. Okay. Convergence has a dramatic impact on Luke Oil. Some companies, it'll have almost no effect on them. Uh, you can see the wide variations. Notice over here on the right-hand side, capital requirements. That's that preceding chart, but with one difference. We require that Luke Oil start issuing debt in 2004, 5, 6, and 7 in order to not overspend its capital inflow. 
In other words, Luke Law is going into some more debt. You can see that over here on the left-hand bottom panel. Notice, though, if prices go very high, that's the kind of dot, the circular dot up here, the lowercase, the surplus of capital hits faster at Luke Oil. In other words, the imperative for more investment outlets grows and comes forward in time which is a common result for all of them. Three different potential solutions that I would suggest to this. Reinvest more in Russia. That only works if you have an outlet. And that's a major institutional barrier today. Capital distributions to shareholders, questionable <laughs> policy probably. More substantive moves towards building an international EMP program. I think that's where you're going to see the movement. The pressure to expand internationally is reinforced by a public policy perception and an internal corporate perception that they need to do more in order to be the true peers of a Shell, an Exxon, and a BP. There is a latent desire to I'll put quotes around this, catch up with the big peers in all dimensions. Also, there's a latent desire <coughs> to catch up with the Chinese, the Indians, and other countries, national oil companies, Petrobras, all going international. There's a latent perception here that that's the next step needed to be the true peer in all dimensions. Uh, finally, institutional rigidities within Russia are going to become a binding constraint on growth. You can't reinvest it internally. There is a key deficiency in Russia institutionally, and, and that's Transneft's role as the transport monopoly. I would suggest to you that the logic of Transneft is a legacy of the past, not a realistic assessment of the future. The concept of pipeline distribution and transport being separate from the upstream sector, which requires it, is not a viable solution in the Russian case, but it is an institutional solution. And to see that that doesn't work elsewhere, look at all the other major frontier business plays in the oil and gas industry, where the integration of the upstream and the downstream is rapidly re-emerging as a key business strategy, LNG, GTL, major oil pipelines, the Caspian Pipeline Consortium, BTC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, the upstream must bear the cost and the risk. <coughs> Lastly, I'm going to speed this up here and kind of wrap up. Capital, invest, capital inflows are increasing. The need for non-Russian capital is falling rapidly. It's actually cratering. As a matter of fact, non-Russian capital is likely to be perceived by both the Russian government and the Russian companies as both unwanted and unneeded competition for insufficient investment opportunities. In short, how do you succeed in Russia if you are a non-Russian company in this new world that's emerging? There's a diminished perceived need for non-Russian companies. That coupled with a growing perceived value of international diversification amongst the Russian companies and the Russian government, perhaps. And I'm speculating there. I, I'm outside my area of knowledge. That could suggest transnational alliances as one of the key solutions. The ConocoPhillips Luke Oil arrangement is sort of suggestive of this approach, but it's really a half measure. It's not at all what I envisage coming. But turn that solution on its head. Let's, let's imagine for a moment we reverse the solution and put it heads up or heads down. 
Russian companies now are the acquirers of leading non-Russian oil companies. That the outlet for that capital, the outlet for that pent-up desire for a, a, a truly recognized international peer is to go outside of Russia. And in fact, the Chinese-Indian models of international expansion through acquisition, but heighten upward. Now, who would do that? Which companies are most likely to do that? I think those early charts would make some interesting suggestions, <coughs> but they would be speculative at best. Um, and one final prediction, and then I will sit down. I apologize for taking so long. <coughs> I haven't heard much about this yet in the industry, but I think it's time we start uh, thinking about it very, very seriously. Uh, I have had the good fortune, I'm old enough, I remember when oil prices were a lot higher than this, in real terms. And I remember when oil prices collapsed to almost nothing in real terms. And I'm still young enough to care <laughs> now that they're going back up. In other words, I've been around for a full industry cycle or what I believe is a cycle. And part and parcel of that cycle is that the fiscal systems of the world cannot adapt quickly enough to the satisfaction of their governments, in most cases. In other words, what we have just seen in Venezuela, what we see in Bolivia, God help them, doing it themselves. But what we see in Bolivia, we hear rumors in Trinidad of rising oil and gas tax rates. The Russian fiscal system is incapable of remaining stable, in my opinion, in the current pricing environment. Taxation will go up. The export duty, the, the royalty system is inadequate to the task. Do not be surprised if very soon there is a special petroleum tax levied in Russia. I think it's coming. I think it is going to be one of the results. One of its benefits is it'll bleed some of this excess capital. If you can think of that as a benefit. But look out, I think it's coming. And I don't think it's just coming in Russia. I think it's coming worldwide. It's something that needs to be looked at very carefully. Thank you very much. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting us to this conference on the energy dimension in the Russian global strategy. Uh, my name is Masumi Motomura. I am a geologist and a researcher for oil and gas industry at Japan Oil and Metals National Corporation, or former Japan National Oil Corporation. This time I'd like to talk about the Russian oil and gas resources and the future production forecast. Put it button. Hmm? Go forward. Oh, this okay. Uh, this is contents. Uh, I'd like to talk about Russian oil production history and its uh, characteristics, and gas production, and oil and gas reserves, the production focus and transportation, and the future activities of East Siberia and Sahalin. Is there any pointer? No. You don't have. No. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, first of all, let me show you a map of hydrocarbon basins in Russia. Um, you might have known at the, at the bottom of, of the map, there's a Caspian Sea. At, the, uh, at Baku, the Russian oil industry was born in the early 19th century. And after the revolution, uh, the new, uh, new economic policy, what, what is called NEP, uh, has has a plan to explore in the Volga Ural region, and major discovery was made after the World War II, like Romashkino and other oil fields. And then, in 1950s, there's a new discovery in West Siberia. So the main 
oil producing area was migrated to the east. And now, the East Siberia, that is still uh, developing. There are several large oil and gas fields, but not but the small amount of production here. Uh, we have frontiers, a Sea of Ohosk, Bering Sea, uh, Kala Sea, and Barents Sea, Laptev, East Siberia. Now, among these uh, frontiers, Barents Sea, which locates to, locates to the north of Timan Pechola, uh, will be the another important producing area in the near future. Um, there's a production profile of Soviet Union and, C and the CIS since 1950s to uh, 2003. And this one for 2005 and 2010 is in a, a focus made by uh, Renaissance Capital. And the vertical axis represents um, Medium ton per year. If you divide it by 50, you will have a million barrels per day. So, so 500 million ton per year is 10 million barrels per day. Um, we should, okay. and throughout the 1950s to 1970s, there is, there is a very stable growth, and it has peaked in 19. 87, that, that was 12.85 million barrels per day. <laughs> and, and then rapid decline uh, after the collapse of Soviet Union. And, and from this, um, we have Russia, Kazakhstan, uh, Azerbaijan, and Turkmenistan on it. Yeah. And rebound of oil production uh, in the Putin there. Yes, um, but these all, most of production comes from uh, West Siberia. Still, West Siberia is very important. And please take a look at this one. This is an export. So another part is domestic, uh, which includes uh, um, how it, products export. But uh, anyway, uh, domestic demand is stable at around 4 million barrels per day. And, uh, it is in, uh, and the remains is allocated to export, and export of oil is, every year we have 500,000 barrels or up to 800,000 barrels per day. This is it. And the next one is uh, um, the decline and the rebound of oil production. Uh, I plotted these reasons. Um, when we discuss about oil production, we need to pay attention to the nature of oil industry, uh, which is uh, compound and is affected by lots of uh, technical and economic uh, factors. Um, we'd like to compare the Eritrean's era and Putin's era. Um, in the short time, uh, not less than, not more than three years, um, there was a, uh, 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 in short time, it, the oil production would be controlled by the, the surface of the field or a condition of oil fields uh, equipment, like Christmas tree, uh, gathering pipelines, pumping unit, and so on, and its level of maintenance. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, it, uh, there was a lack of maintenance uh, due to economic uh, collapse, and manufacturers in Baku, which had a share of 60% of Soviet were uh, suffered by political turmoil, and, and at the time, no equipment was supplied to the oil fields. Uh, this, this kind of chaos uh, caused rapid decline of oil and production, oil production. Uh, and, and there's a delay of re well repair. In late 1990s, uh, or since the year 2000, the situation has improved, improved uh, dramatically and renewal of oil fields was accomplished, uh, which happened to coincide with the Putin era. Increasing oil price uh, turned out to be the windfall profit for Russian oil companies and back up this trend. Uh, so there is a good investment in the oil fields, which made a rebound of oil production. But at the, at the same time, uh, there is an uh, effect of medium term uh, for more than uh, three to 10 years and that's the factor of underground, uh, uh, which might have caused serious damage to the oil fields 
at the time uh, due to overuse of water flood and lack of idea of oil field management, which is a systematic idea of development of oil fields. The most important thing is that the large portion of the recent production, re uh, production growth here uh, was achieved by the modern technologies, uh, Western, Western standard technologies uh, brought by Schlumberger uh, or Halliburton. And that is horizontal drilling, hydro flexuring, and submersible pumps, et cetera. Uh, and which was uh, systematically applied to ha handle the oil, oil fields as an uh, appropriate method of development. In long term, uh, more than 10 years, in, put, in El Tenziela, there's no wildcat frontier in the frontier region. And even now, almost no wildcats in frontier regions, so it, it is still a problem of lack of investment in frontier region. But still, there is several undevelopment giant field which uh, will produce in near future with, if we have lots of investment in this area. And Russian oil production uh, which, uh, by company. Uh, so I plotted the nine major oil companies of Russia. Uh, so you will notice the several groups of here. Uh, this is the year of production from year 2000 to 2003. And one group is Yukos and Shibnet, which shows uh, tremendous growth. And its rate of growth is between 15 to 20 percent. And another rather stable growth of Luke Oil, Surgut Neftigas, TNK BP, and Rosneft, uh, Slavneft. And uh, the third group is no increment in Tartneft and Bashneft. And the first group of Yukos and Shibneft has a company policy to invite or to to invite foreign uh, Western technology, and those are very successful to improve productions. And other companies uh, uh, say, especially for Sudgut Neftigas, uh, this is a very xenophobic company. They don't like Western style uh, technology. <laughs> and the president of this company is a uh, drilling engineer, and very strong much man. He beat Japan this year. <laughs> and, and, and how should I put it? The Kremlin like those style of companies maybe very much, but uh, how should I put it? They just replace equipments and keep a continuous investment to the field, and they achieve such a such a kind of uh, production growth. But Yukos and Shibnesh has much more smart technology uh, to manage the oil fields, so that there is a big difference of growth. And Tatnefsh and Bashnefsh, Tatnefsh is from Tatarstan and Bashnefsh from Bashkortostan. Those are from Volga Ula region, and this is the very old oil field region, so there's no room to make a new exploration. Mm -hmm. So that's the summary of this, of this one. Uh, number one producer uh, since 2003 is Yukos, and highest production growth. And that is Shibneft and Yukos uh, in introducing Schramberg and Halberton Hal technology. Uh, stable growth is Luke Oil, uh, Slugut Neft Gas, or maybe uh, uh, Losneft, and uh, a rather xenophobic at attitude. And uh, Losneft was merged by Gazprom, and the company policy will be changed very much, but we can see uh, what, what will happen next. Uh, no increment is uh, Tartneft and Bashneft. And it's, it's a threat of interest in promising TNK BP. Uh, BP has an, a very keen interest to the TNK fields like Samothrore and other oil fields in West Siberia. And they got merged in last year, September the 1st. So please take a look. The production growth has become much more steeper. So in, maybe in the year 2004, uh, TNK BP would be much more successful and shows very dramatic uh, growth like uh, Yukos and Shubneft. And see next one. 
uh, let's take a look at the gas production. And this is uh, plotted from 1950 to 2003. And there was a very stable growth from uh, up to 1990. And after the collapse of Soviet Union, there was a stable decline. And it's rebounded since 2002. And this is because the, the one lar very large oil fields, uh, sorry, gas field in West Siberia named Zaporyarnoy started production in, in the, uh, sep September 1st, 2001. And, and the trend has rebounded again. But in the future, they expected very slow production growth. Let's take, uh, and this is okay. And let's take a look at the map. And we have large gas field in northern part of West Siberia, Ulengoy, uh, Medvedje, Yambul. And from the year two, 2001, Zapriyarnoy started to produce. Yeah. And um, how should I uh, The problem is uh, Zapriyarnoy is the last oil field which can develop with uh, conventional prices. Uh, they can produce gas uh, at, at the cost of $25 per 1,000 cubic meters. And, and after that, uh, in Russia, there's a large oil field in Yamal Peninsula, but the permafrost region starts from around here. So the development cost will increase twice and third times larger than this. So it's not easy to expand production, though it, geologically lots of potential, but uh, they need lots, lots, lots more investment uh, to do that. Now in the middle part of the West Siberia, there's lots of main oil fields and some of the of Salim. And Pliobiskoy is the one of the most important ones, and in which Yugos is handling. And uh, last year it produced 515,000 barrels per day, and in next year it will produce 500,000 barrels per day. So one of the most successful oil, oil fields after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And now I would like to point out that the oil reserves of Russian published by the Oil and Gas Journal, or BP Statistics, are not so uh, reliable, uh, which has, in the year 2000, which has only 4.7% uh, of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and the year 2002, it increased 6% 6, 6 abruptly. And, uh, and there's no mention about that in Oil and Gas Journal. And this is another <laughs> description. Oh, I can't read. Uh, this is, uh, in the year 2000, the U.S. Geological Survey made a report and about the world oil reserves, and, and in it, and the, the, the reserves of Soviet Union is three times larger than this, larger than uh, oil and gas journals report. And two years later, uh, we made a re-evaluation of the USGS report, uh, just adding the new discovery and subtracting the production. And this is the result. And it has the 14% 14, 14 uh, 14 of the world, which is the Russians, Russian oil reserves in the world. Uh, so this is next to Saudi Arabia. Uh, most of people say that Iraq would, is the next, uh, second largest oil field. Uh, uh, Iraq is a country of second largest oil reserves. Uh, but maybe that is not true. Russia would be the second country. And of course, in gas reserves, Russia is by far number one. Okay. Uh, this is the oil reserve of the world. And Saudi Arabia has 22.9, and Russia has 14%, so very large. And so it has lots of uh, geological potential. And this is for gas, no doubt, 26.9. Uh, And so I'll skip this then. Uh, but uh, let's, let's talk about it. And uh, West Siberia occupies 68% of oil reserves and 75% of gas reserves of Russia, uh, which has been the uh, 
largest production region in Russia and will be the region of largest in next decade. There's, a, there's a still lots of undis, undeveloped field in Russia, as I told you before. So there's uh, uh, lots of opportunity to expand oil and gas production. This is a uh, forecast made by uh, Russian Ministry of Energy last year. Mm -hmm. um, from uh, this is a st mm, strategy to year to uh, oil and, uh, sorry energy strategy to up to 2020. Yeah. And uh, oil production in 2000, 2020 will increase in the level between uh, 450 million tons. That is. Nine million barrels per day, and a bit, or in optimistic case, uh, 520 million ton per year. That's an, uh, uh, 10, uh, sorry, uh, uh, 10.4 million barrels per day. So, uh, but anyway, <coughs> when you're coming close to the year 2020, and the production will still rise, but it will level off. Mm -hmm. But uh, how shall I put it? Um, this was made by the Ministry of the Energy last year, but that, this ministry has no power to control oil fields. So each private oil company has their own focus. And when we're summing up, uh, we, we have a conclusion of, which is 10% uh, or 20% more than this optimistic case. And, uh, so this, this, mean, this uh, focus would be a rather conservative one. And I'd like to point out an another thing. Uh, the West Siberia will decrease in the year 2020. And instead of that, uh, this yellow column is West Siberia. Uh, instead of that, the brown color, East Siberia and Far East, will start to produce and this, and, and just um, compensate its decline. So Russia will still keep uh, a little growth or the level of, level of, of production. Uh, next one is pipeline system of Russia. Um, main export terminal are located in Baltic Sea and Black Seas. Oil production is coming close to the uh, Pipeline capacity, which is uh, around a, a little more than four million barrels per day, but according to Russian regulation, and the, all the capacity has 20% uh, extra capacity. So, so nowadays it comes to the all, almost same level as capacity, but still some room to expand export. But the conclusion is. Uh, the, they need a new pipeline to export or keep on the production growth. Uh, Mr. Putin announced uh, the necessity of new pipeline in this annual message to uh, Congress, in, uh, that is in May 24th. And those are enlargement of Baltic pipeline, this one, to Primorsk. Uh, and the second one is a pipeline from West Siberia, this is West Siberia, to Barents Sea. Uh, it's very strange that Mr. Putin didn't mention about, didn't talk, didn't mention Murmansk port. So there's some possibility that uh, the pipeline up to uh, some coast in northern, northern uh, in the southern, southern coast of Timon Pechora, uh, uh, there's still controversy where to, where to construct uh, export terminal. And the third one is Pacific Pipeline uh, from Angarsk or Taishet to Nahotka or maybe uh, to China. The third one is Bos uh, to make a Bosporus bypass. This is Bo uh, the Black Sea and this is Bosporus Strait. And there's a similar idea to make a bypass route so close to Bosporus Strait or to uh, Burgos Alexandropos or even to, to the Adriatic Sea. And the final one is Brody Odessa and Adriatic pipeline 
Uh, this is Odessa airport, and Brody is somewhere around here. And there's lots of controversy this year in Ukraine government. government. And uh, there's a final conclusion is to re reverse this pipeline system. And this is the Druzhba pipeline to the Eastern Europe and oil export from Druzhba pipeline and coming back to Black Sea. Another one is to extend pipeline to Omisari port in Adriatic Sea. But, but, but the final one is uh, it's not a... Uh, it's not expand the capacity of oil pipeline because uh, this is just you know, some extension of uh, Druzhba, so it does not uh, contribute to the oil, uh, oil export, oil, oil ex export, uh, en enlargement of oil exports. So the uh, most important thing is to make a pipeline to the east or to balance it. That would be the unique solution. This is a summary. And the next one is map of gas pipeline uh, of CIS and Asian area. Uh, the most uh, realistic plan which will materialize in the near future is North Europe gas pipeline from maybe from Stockmanov gas field uh, through, ba uh, through Baltic Sea up to Buckton in England. The gas pipeline to the east has lots of problems uh, to, to China or to Korea. There's a uh, the long-term negotiation and f for 10 years. And maybe uh, the biggest issue is gas price. Yeah. Yeah. And at the same time, China completed gas pipeline from uh, Xinjiang Uyghur area to Shanghai uh, this year. And from, the, from October 1st, that's the festival in China, is start operate. So for China, yeah. the domestic gas is much more important than Russian gas, and so it has priority. So in the in in the future, there may be possibility that China will import gas from maybe from Kobikta or other gas field. But how uh, should it, It's still uh, lots of difficulty uh, to to do that. <coughs> And the production potential of East Siberia is uh, concentrated in Krasnoyarsk, uh, southern part of Krasnoyarsk area, and Irkutsk Oblast, and the Sahar Republic, somewhere around here. And the other area is offshore Sakhalin. This, this is the main part of the uh, East Siberia. Uh, this is Lake Baikal, and in Krasnoyarsk Klai, there is a uh, Kuyumbin oil, gas oil field and Yulbuchin oil field. And Yulbuchin oil field is operated by Yukos, Kuyumbin by uh, Slavnevsky and other companies. In, in Irkutsk Oblast, uh, there is a Kobikta gas field and Berfnechon Square oil field. And in Sahar Republic, there is a Talakan oil field. Uh, it was occupied, uh, it, it has an, uh, uh, Yukos subsidiary has a license of Talakan field, but it was transferred to uh, Surgut Neftigas right now. And there's another field, Chayandin. This is a large gas field, but which has uh, oil, oil reserves also. And now no company has license, there, so maybe the end of this year, or maybe next year, uh, we will have an uh, auction uh, for this field. So there's uh, lots of oil fields, and uh, say, Berefne Chon Square has an, uh, mm, 1.2 billion barrels of reserves. Uh, Tarakan Square has an, uh, around 1 billion barrels, barrels of reserves. And uh, Kobikta has an, uh, 50 trillion cubic feet. So those are very large oil fields. So if we have a pipeline, uh, it, it, it's very, uh, there would be no problem to start production at all. Verifone uh, Chonsko has an, uh, around several <coughs> tens of drilling wells, of production wells, so it's ready to produce. And Talkan is also. And Europe chain is now producing uh, and using the tank lorries and transport to the 
uh, pipeline to Angarsk or uh, East Siberian Railway. Mm. So, and Sakhalin, uh, we have uh, we have uh, Chaibo and Odokt fields in Sakhalin one and Tritonastov Square and Luni of Sakhalin two, and there is Sakhalin three. Sakhalin 4, Sakhalin 5, Sakhalin 6 acreage. Um, Sakhalin 1 and two, uh, 1 to 5, uh, there are progress uh, are going on. The most important impact uh, is an engagement of gas, Gazprom into the Rosneft, uh, Rosneft interest. Uh, Sakh in Sakhalin 1, Rosneft has 20%, and Sakhalin 2, uh, Rosneft has 0%, but uh, but the negotiation is going on. Uh, Gazprom will take 20% of Sakhalin 2 and just exchanging the uh, license of the Priyarno ga gas field, which has an oil deposit in the lower part. Uh, and Sakhalin 3, uh, Rusneft has 33.3 uh, three, or some part. In Wenin, it has 100%. Uh, so this, this will go to Gazprom. And, and Sakhalin 4 and 5, and there's a new discovery in Sakhalin 5. 49% uh, is occupied by Rosneft, and it will be an uh, asset of Gazprom. So the Gazprom will, will have a very strong role in this area, but it, it doesn't come out yet. We are, we are very much interested in it, but there's no such a kind of thing. Two minutes? <laughs> and now I'd like to talk about conclusion. Uh, Russia will keep its production growth until 2020, uh, uh, though becoming level off in 2010s. And West Siberia will pick out and start to decline in 2010s. However, uh, production growth of East Siberia and Sakhalin will compensate it. Uh, to increase production level, new pipeline infrastructure, especially to the East, is indispensable. Uh, the two tackle in investment, uh, public sector's initiative especially in East Siberian, Siberia area, must be taken. Uh, the reorganization of oil industry in Russia is now going on, uh, which may accelerate the investment in this area. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we're going to take a, uh, a few questions. I may have to delay our break briefly because the professor who is speaking at 1045 has a class later in the morning. So we may have a little impression there. We may take our break after uh, his talk. But for a few minutes, uh, I want to see if anybody in the audience has some questions for our, our first panelist. Dr. Gordon. Uh, the question is, and for companies like Luke Oil or Russian companies, to what extent, even though they have trapped domestic production sold at low prices, do they make it up in, in better refining margins because of transfer prices to the downstream operations? That's been a very important mechanism at work, and you see it in the, uh, in the uh, not only the expanding role of the refined product mix in total, but the, the export portion in particular. Uh, which is sort of where the transfer pricing problem can raise its ugly tax head at, at that point where you, you, you get into that kind of a situation. But thus far, uh, that's, that's played a major role in, in kind of uh, helping to get around that problem. Uh, in the models that we used, in fact, recognizing that, we had to when we show production of crude oil for export for certain companies with substantial refining and marketing networks, we are weaving into that the portion of own crude supplies that are processed and then subsequently exported as refined product, because otherwise the results would have been grossly skewed. Um, just a quick question. The, um, by the discussion of several pipelines here, um, of the big, really big pipelines that people feel need to be built in order for Russia to expand its exports, um, which ones seem to be the most likely right now? Did you hear me? Uh, I think uh, the pipeline to the Pacific will have the priority. Uh, of course, uh, the, the first priority is expanding the Baltic pipeline 
but uh, there, there is already the, the pipeline that the, with the capacity of 1 million barrels per day was constructed, and they want to expand it 1.24 uh, million barrels per day. So it's very easy. Uh, so the second priority would be the Pacific pipeline. And the pipeline to balance sea has, uh, has no possibility, I think, because uh, uh, Transneft idea is very, how say, very vague, and we can't find re no reality about that. Uh, as far as draft of the gas price report, I get get the sensation from your comments that what's happening in Russia is the Russian government is going to take energy and make it its diplomatic tool uh, to regain its sense of its place in the world and overcome this feeling of uh, inferiority that they've had for the last 10 years with the collapse of communism. And so that analyzing anything in the energy industry in Russia would be better to look at the political history and the psyche of the Russians uh, rather than economic terms. Is that? I, I would suggest you, you've got to have a, a balance between the two. I, I, I absolutely believe that, yes, there is a uh, if you look at the way many of the Russian companies present themselves to the outside world, um, they'll make comparisons of themselves based on volume of reserves or production and, and show that they're the equal of an ExxonMobil or a BP or a Shell. Um, what they're not showing, though, is the part that I was referring to, and that is that whereas a in terms of sheer size, they're the equal of an Exxon, but in terms of diversification and depth of opportunities, they're not. They're, they're much, and that's not, that's not a, a criticism of the Russian government, that's a recognition of the reality. It's the same reality, by the way, that confronted Petrobras when it made the decision a few years ago to go international and, and initiated a series of acquisitions, including uh, Perez come punk. Uh, it, it's it's a it's both a political and an economic reality interacting together, and I think it, when you when you think of it in those terms, then you can see it as a solution which solves two very important problems at one time, and that's sort of what I'm suggesting to you. Uh, 